All right, so we read the, uh, the chapter there, Psalm 62, and so that's where I'm going to be taking the sermon from tonight. Um, the sermon's going to be about the Lord is our rock. Um, so we're going to cover um, the Lord who is our rock of salvation. You know, So in regard to salvation of our souls, of course, we know he's that, but that's not what I'll be going into very much today. Um, even though a lot of these scriptures you can apply to both salvation of the soul and salvation of the flesh, we'll be concentrating more on the latter because um, I feel that's quite important and it doesn't often get preached on. So just here in Psalm 62, verse 1, it says, Truly my soul waiteth upon him, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. My soul, wait thou only upon God. Sorry, that's verse 5. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. So David here, through the uh, inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is expressing that salvation comes from the Lord. So today we're going to be fo focusing on that salvation of the flesh, salvation from our enemies, you know, the Lord as our stronghold and protector. So uh, I'll get you to turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we'll read in verse 1. And after that I'll get you to turn to Numbers chapter 20. But in Deuteronomy 32, 1, it says... Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So yeah, I'll get you to turn to Numbers chapter 20 as well. But, you know, the question is, who is our rock? You know, it's the Lord our God. He's the rock. You know, what are the attributes of a rock? You know, it's stability, firmness, you know, foundational and unmovable. And these are the traits of God. It says, uh, for I am, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. It also says, Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. So that's why he's our rock. He's our foundation for everything. Because he's unmovable and unchangeable. And Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So you should be there in Numbers chapter 20. We'll pick up in verse 7. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and he shall bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as commanded him. So take note, he commands him to speak ye to the rock. Um, but see what Moses does. It says that Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and said unto them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with the rod he smote the rock twice. That was not what Christ commanded him. It says, Then the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and was sanctified in them. So we'll see this again in some other scriptures. So I'll get you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. But you see that Moses was instructed to speak to the rock. But because he was wrathful with the children of Israel, he called them rebels. Um, because they were murmuring and complaining against the Lord, he smote it instead. So, and Moses was punished for that by not being allowed to enter into the promised land. But, you know, he did see it from the mountains, but he never entered in. Um, so in Nehemiah 12, uh, chapter 9, verse 12, it says, Moreover, thou lettest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. 
Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbaths, and commandments and precepts, statutes and laws, by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger. That was the manna that he brought down from heaven. It says, And brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And promise them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them. So the Lord the Rock, he was their deliverer out of the land of Egypt. You know, they took them through the wilderness and into the promised land, providing them with food and water and everything they needed on the way. You know, but the Lord was not the one who failed to deliver. You know, it was the people who failed, you know, when they angered the Lord. You know, and so they didn't receive all the blessings that he promised them. In Psalm 78... You can actually turn there if you like. Uh, Psalm 78 verse 14, it says again, In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. That was when they were asking for quail. You know, the manna that he gave them wasn't enough and the water he gave them wasn't enough. They just continued to murmur and complain about the food he was giving them. So in verse 19, Yea, they, yet, yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God, and they trusted not in his salvation. So they murmured and complained about the lack of food and water, you know, even though he provided more than enough. And they didn't trust in the rock of salvation. You know, and that's the Lord. Uh, and that's what I'm here to establish today, you know, that the Lord, he's the rock of our salvation, not just of our souls, but he's also our provider, our protector, if we trust in him. So in Psalm 105, verse 39, he spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light in the night. The people asked and he brought, brought quails and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and the waters gushed out. They ran in the dry places like a river, for he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. And he brought forth his people with joy, and his chosen with gladness, and gave them the lands of the heathen, and they inherited the labor of the people, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise you, the Lord. So again, we see that observing to do the statutes and keeping the law is a part of pleasing the Lord. You know, and I covered that in my last sermon on Psalm 15. Um, but we see the same thing also in Isaiah. I'll get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 48. But it's just also as important as James chapter 1. You know, it says, don't be just a hearer of the word, but a doer also. Because if you're a hearer only, then it's vanity, and it's of no profit to yourself or to others. So in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. O oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. So again, if we want our peace to be with God, then we need to keep his commandments. You know, we'll also have, we'll have peace as a river, and our righteousness as the waves of the sea. But, you know, if we choose not to keep his commandments, then the other side of the coin is we get chastisement of the Lord, you know, and we're not pleasing him at all. It says in uh, verse 19, Thy seed also had been, right, had been as the sand, and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off, nor destroyed from before me. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob, and they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts, and he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. There is no peace, saith the Lord, 
unto the wicked. So again, if you don't, don't want to be considered wicked in the eyes of the Lord, then keep his commandments and do your best to walk with him. So I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But if we want the Lord to be our protector, our provider, our rock of strength and refuge, then we need to be fellowshipping with him. You know, and that's through the commandments and statutes. James 4 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse ye hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So again, we see that you know, if you want to fellowship with the Lord, if you want the Lord to draw nigh to you, then he wants you to clean your hands and purify your heart through the washing of regeneration of his word and his perfect laws. So in 1 Corinthians 10, we'll start in verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. It's talking about the same events that we've just been reading about. It says, And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the... To the Sorry, where are we? Intent we should not... We're examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as some of them, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, my, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So we see again that while the Lord's the rock, you brought forth water out of the wilderness, provided the manna from heaven. I believe this is signifying the Spirit of God and is a picture of spiritual salvation, um, which I have preached in a sermon called Calling Upon the Name of the Lord. I went, went into it in a lot more detail. Um, but it says, the Lord was displeased, they kept not his statutes, and didn't believe in him to be their protector and their provider in the wilderness. It says they strove with him there in Deuteronomy 32, and it makes it clear just how fierce God's anger was toward them. But you also notice here that the Lord being the rock of our salvation goes very well hand in hand with keeping the commandments, to not committing sin, to abstaining from sin. You know, that's something that Paul makes very clear here in 1 Corinthians 10. You know, it's just after he's got through about why God was wrathful with them. It's because they murmured, they complained, they fornicated, they committed all, all types of idolatry and sin, which just brought the wrath of God upon them. So in Deuteronomy 32, verse 15, it says, But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoke him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they, whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are, are, are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with they which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of thy mountains. 
I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon, upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I also will send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without, the terror within, shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the men of grey hairs. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among them. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. So that, can, that uh, paints a pretty dramatic picture you know, of how the Lord felt about being forsaken by his people. You know, in verse 18 it says, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. You know, so we're begotten of God, we must never forget that. You know, and I say all this because it's a warning that we would not take the Lord our rock lightly and forsake his commandments as the children of Israel did. You know, to keep his statutes and his salvation. You know, we're his people, we're his chosen, we're his children, and we should fear the Lord and not want to anger him in the same way they did. Because as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. So it brings me to the next point. You know, I believe I've established that the Lord, he is our God, and he is the rock of our salvation. So we're going to cover a few passages on how that applied to David and how we can apply that to ourselves. So we'll continue in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 30. It says, How shall one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our en enemies themselves being judges. So even our enemies know that our rock is not like their rock. You know, their rock has no power. Their gods have no power. But they understand that our rock is different. And we've got uh, Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And uh, we've got 2 Corinthians 12 9. It says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches and necessities, in persecutions and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So Paul trusted in the Lord that when he said his affliction was not going to go away, that God could use that weakness to show his great strength. You know, and the same goes for us. Our weaknesses, whatever they may be, they allow the Lord to show his strength through us. You know, and it's the Lord who receives the glory in that case, and not us. And we see it, we see it with uh, Jonathan and the armor bearer in 1 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 14. Um, you see it with David versus the Philistines and Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, 37, it reads, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the poor of the lion and out of the poor of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now David had no doubt about the Lord providing a victory for him there because he'd already provided victories in the past. Um, but David just said, he doesn't waver here at all. He just says, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. So he was not worried at all. And you had Gideon with the 300 men versus the Midianites. Now that was another great victory with few where God showed his strength through weakness. Um, you had Samson, one man, against a thousand other men. He killed with the jawbone of an ass. You know, and we can also think about soul winning. You know, it says the Lord chooses to save men by the foolishness of preaching. You know, so our weakness shows his strength and he receives the glory. So the next point I want to get on to is that vengeance is not ours to take. So in Deuteronomy 32, verse 35... It says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. So when it comes to our battles, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, um, but we do fight spiritual battles every day, especially when you go out soul winning. 
And if the Lord can put 10,000 to flight with one man, then you surely can win your spiritual battles. And only if you're trusting in the Lord and you're fellowshipping with him and leaning on him and his understanding, then we see that vengeance belongs to the Lord and we just need to leave it up to him. Romans 12, 19, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And Paul's quoting a proverb, but notice that the proverb 25 actually adds something else at the end. On the end of Proverbs 5, uh, 25, 21, it says, for, sorry, 22, it says, For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So we're told to love our enemies, you know, and if you do so, the Lord will recompense your enemies when they do evil to you, but he'll also reward you for not taking vengeance into your own hands. Um, Proverbs 24 says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. So the opposite is true as well. If you do take it into your own hands, the Lord's displeased, and he, not only will he not recompense your enemies, but you will also re, uh, receive chastisement of the Lord. You know, so that's not what you want either. You want to let the Lord handle your battles and let him take vengeance. As he says, it does belong to him. So we'll wrap up with uh, Psalm 18, starting in verse 1. So that's Psalm 18, verse 1. It says, uh, this, is, this is the psalm, it's also the same as um, 2 Samuel 22. Uh, this is the song after Saul has been chasing David and David's had victory over his enemies. And it says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. So again, we see the Lord hears our cries for help. He hears our prayers and he says, let me take care of it. Let me you know, have vengeance on your enemies. You love them, let me take care of them. And if you need protection, that's why he's called all these things. You know, the, the buckler, the high tower, my deliverer, my fortress, my rock. You know, these things are all interchangeable. That's his protection for us. So if you want protection, just cry out to the Lord because he will hear you. Because look at what it says here afterwards. After, you know, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. So the Lord fights for us. And the best thing you, the best thing you can do rather than fight your own battles and try and do it in your own strength, is to be like David and just pray for the protection of the Lord and pray that he'll fight this battle for you. You know, let him be your buckler of protection and your refuge. Verse 14 of the same chapter says, Yet he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomforted them. So again, the Lord delivered David from his enemies. Verse 16, He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me. They were too strong for me. And then David rested in the Lord and took no vengeance for himself. Verse 18, they prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. But why is that? Why were his hands clean? And why was he righteous? It says, For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. 
I also was upright before him, and I kept myself from, from mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. With the merciful thou, shalt, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. So again, you know, how you want to be treated by God is how you would treat God. You know, if you're upright in his eyes, then he'll treat you as an upright man. You know, you, if you're merciful to others, it says he'll show mercy on you. But if you don't show mercy to your brother and you don't forgive others, then he will not forgive you and will not show mercy on you. So this is how we should live our lives, is how we want God to treat us, is how we should treat our brethren. And we also see the, uh, that he kept the statutes and commandments of God and the Lord rewarded him according to that because he let, the, he let the Lord deal with his enemies to fight his battles and to have vengeance on them. He didn't take it upon himself. So verse 31, For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. And I love that he calls his salvation a shield, because to us it is, if you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost inside you, then you have that shield. You know, and you know that nothing can come of you, nothing can ever happen to you, because, you know, you're never going to be condemned and go to hell. You have that shield of salvation. That means, you know, you can serve the Lord with impunity. So this is what I want to finish up with. You know, the Lord God, he is our rock. He's our foundation. He's our protector. He fights all our battles if we let him. It's he that gives us rest. And it's he that saves us, not just from our enemies, but also from internal damnation. So it's more, most important that he is the redeemer of our souls, you know, if you have believed on the name of the Son of God. So let's pray.